Um, you know, there's a lot of complexity in project management and in quality management. And it's, it's all a bit silly because you can take the most complicated management system in the world for designers and builders. And it comes down to four principles. Episode 127. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the second half of my interview with architect, author, Brian Palmquist. He's also the director of quality at LedCore, an international construction firm with 14 offices in North America. But before I jump into that, I wanted to let you know a little bit about the Business of Architecture Summit. We're quickly coming up upon that next month. You've heard me talking about it here on the podcast a little bit. I wanted to tell you, I'm pretty excited. We have one of our speakers is Chad Ludeman. Now, Chad has a remarkable story to tell. You won't want to miss this. He, they have built a cutting edge real estate development firm using only small local architecture firms in the worst economy in decades. So he's actually an architect, uh, designer turned developer, real estate developer. They've been doing some very, very cool stuff with sustainable design, urban infill. And you're definitely going to want to hear his story as he talks about how they were able to build this cutting edge real estate development firm in frankly, one of the worst economies in decades. So to grab your tickets for the Business of Architecture Summit and have access to all the recordings for future dates, you can go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash summit. That's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash summit. And with that, let's jump into our interview here with Brian Palmquist. He's going to talk a little bit more about the checklist, about quality control um, tactics that he uses and that he's developed through his software program, which you can find at quality-works.net. So without further ado, here's my interview with architect Brian Palmquist. Brian, beyond beyond having meetings and discussing and, and being on top of things like that, how, how should a firm set up a quality control process in their practice? Do you have any tips or pointers for doing that successfully? Sure, you can use my software. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about your software. <laughs> um, well, it, it, the the book uh, is a, is a the book can be read completely independently of of that. Um, uh, but um, I spent um, well, I, I I had a, a web based quality management and pro- project management program fully operational um, on the web two years before The Economist magazine announced that the web existed. So uh, I've been doing this a long time. Um, uh, and there's a, a lot of history of that, but I don't need to go into that. Um, what the book talks about is that, um, you know, there's a lot of complexity in project management and in quality management. And it's it's all a bit silly because you can take the most complicated management system in the world for designers and builders and it comes down to four principles. Um, uh, record the work, uh, resolve the issues, uh, review the results, and remember and learn to improve. Record, resolve, review, remember. Uh, if you have a system that does those four, you're 80% there already. If you don't, and, and it needs to be a system because one of the things that happens to builders and designers both is that you get into the, 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 the tussle, the fray of construction, and nothing is perfect. Things go wrong. And the client is watching all of this play out. And if either the designer or the builder um, fumbles the ball around issues, then that's what they remember. Um, if 
every project has challenges and issues and deficiencies and non-conformances. And if it appears to the client that you have a systematic way of managing that, and there aren't millions of them, but you know, there's, but you are systematic in how you deal with that stuff. That's what they remember. And, they, and, and other than the very naive clients, uh, commercial clients, sophisticated clients will come back to you because you got that and your esteemed competitors don't. So four principles. And the other thing is you only need three, what I call three tool sets to uh, manage a project and manage quality. Um, I, I, I attended a presentation of a construction management software piece um, a while back, very expensive, designed more for contractors and consultants. And they very proudly announced that their system had 96 modules. And I thought to myself, okay, that's about 19 more than I would ever want to deal with. So that complexity just drives you nuts. And you spend your whole life hopping around from A to B to X to 14.2 to, to whatever it is. So, so in my world, there are three components to three tools to, um, to manage any project. And I've managed $2 billion projects with these three tools. So, and I've also managed much smaller projects. Um, so the first tool is something that contractors know and architects see, but they don't often do. And that's what I call a, a, a work plan or a, a, in, in my internet world, an I work plan. Um, and that's where you basically lay out all the steps from the beginning to the end in more or less workflow order, but it's not a schedule. Uh, a work plan says, here are the things we're going to do. And recognizing that increasingly we're not able to fully mentor people, here are the instructions on how to do each step. And if there are any forms or templates that are needed or checklists, here they are. So you can basically motor through this work plan from beginning to end uh, and find all the pieces that you need and keep a diary as you're going of what's happening. You can capture the issues that are related and attach them to the right place. It sounds actually more complex than it is. Um, but um, so what I developed was an ability to, as an architect, I, I was lucky enough to find a, uh, a software writer who I could get along with and who we had this deal. We've had this deal for 10 years now that I tell Mark how to design and build a building and he puts it into code and makes sure that it is compliant with ISO 9001, which is the most probably strictest in international quality management system. And it's, it's funny because I do something and he comes back and I say, no, 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 Mark, too much jargon. What's a, what's a corrective action procedure? What you're trying to tell me is there's a deficiency and we got to fix it. You know, like let's use real language that designers and builders can understand. So we've been having this tussle for 10 years and the result of it is pretty straightforward stuff. The key thing about the work plan is that, uh, and this is sort of mentioned in the book, I've identified 10 filters or what I call the 10 C's that can apply to every piece of every project that you will ever do. So um, if you, so let's say you're working on a project and you have a, uh, and you've never done a job with the school district of Nashville and uh, but you've done schools. So you have in your standard work plan, a typical flow of what you do to, to design and, and build a school. Um, and then you discover that Nashville has four different things that they want to do at different phases in the project. And they're all reasonable. They're just unique to the client. So you, uh, you tag those Nashville school and you put them in your database. And the next time you do a school for Nashville, you, t you tick the Nashville school tag. And in addition to all the other stuff, the, the pieces that pertain to that um, a client populate your work plan. So if, if, if the person who's done all the other Nashville school work is on holiday, left the company, not available, and somebody more new is in there, um, you know, you, you've got a better chance of getting it right. Um, so, so the 10 C's, I should have written them down here, but I always forget to do that, um, are client, consultant, contractor, contract, um, community, calendar, 
um, cost, construction, climate, and complexity. And if I haven't got 10, hopefully no one was counting. I'm close to it. But, but if you tag your data that way, then what you're doing is you, as you work through projects is you're building not just a work plan or a work plan library, you're building a practice. So when you come to think about succession planning, like one of the problems with our profession is that um, the expertise gets in the elevator and goes home. And one day the so-called expertise says to the younger folks, how'd you like to buy in? And the younger folks say, well, that's great. But what am I buying? Um, you know, because they haven't got the content. And so what I tried to do was to create a, a place where you could capture that in a, in a way that you can then say to your associates that you want to bring into the business or sell a business to, that's the content. I mean, there's always that personal thing, and that's important, obviously. But in terms of the guts of how a, a, a practice operates, if you capture that in a methodical way, that has value for your successors, in my opinion. So work plan, that's just one tool. Second tool um, are what I call actions. And actions are the transitory pieces of work and issues that arise during a job. So for me, a submittal is an action. A mock-up is an action. A field review is an action. A non-conformance is an action. A deficiency is an action. A change order is an action. All of these pieces. And, and the reason I say that is that I have one electronic template to do an action. And, uh, and you, you pick a couple of different categories and that determines what kind of an action it is. And you have different formats you can use to manage it. But, um, so let's say the contractor sends me an email saying, um, I think we have a problem with this detail. I can't figure it out. And you look at it and say, well, you know, I'm going to send you a site instruction. So you, capture his note in the application, you send him an action called a site instruction. He then says, no, nah, that's not a site instruction. That's extra money. And, you know, you've all been through that tussle. So, so you, um, let's say you <laughs> agree times. after some discussion. Sorry. I said too many times. Yeah. Yeah. So you agree after that discussion that, that, uh, there is a, a, a change order. Now the, the program that has 96 modules wants you to take that site instruction and set it aside and open up a new document called a contemplated change order. Well, I think that's dumb. In my world, you change the, the type of the document, you add a bit more data, and then the same piece becomes a new piece. And then maybe it becomes a change order, maybe it becomes a change directive. It's all captured. And, and the one of the toughest things that we did, but we have done it successfully, is um, along the way, um, so you know how we, we all run an email. So so if you're the designer and the builder, I send you that email about the site instruction. You send me something back. We have an email discussion and then a site instruction comes out. We have an email discussion and then a change order, all that kind of stuff. So what we've done is set our, our, our system up so that every one of those pieces is automatically captured by the originating piece. So I, I've had, when there've been big arguments, I've had uh, strings of stuff like 25 pages long. But rather than having all these multiple Outlook emails that just get longer and longer and longer and people come and go, it's all automatically captured um, with the originating piece. And so somebody coming in halfway along can see more accurately what's happened. And when it's all done, you don't have, you can get rid of all that email because it's all been automatically captured. It creates an automatic archive of everything. So that's kind of the action item. And, the other thing is you can slice and dice them however you want. So uh, on one of my projects, if if uh, the client says, I'm going to stop by in 15 minutes, I want to talk about the problem we're having on level three. So so I find the, the list of item action items on level three. At the same time, I say, okay, can I have a list, please, of all the open action items that have been assigned to the client, all the stuff that's in his court? So he comes along in 15 minutes. We have our discussion, um, and it can be all happening on the phone, too, because it's fairly quick, our discussion about that issue. And they say, well, while I got you here, Bob, um, how, how are we doing with this and this and this and this and this? Um, so it, it allows you to maximize the productivity of your contact with people and, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And then the other thing is that the third piece is uh, what I call I know how, a knowledge database. So... 
So if I've done a submittal review in the way I described earlier, using an action, and let's say it's a successful review of an alternate product, uh, and I, but I don't want to do that brain damage again. So I can click a button that says um, convert to knowledge item, and it'll take a copy of everything, all of, this, all of the paperwork, all of the notes, everything, and move it to a new place um, where subject matter experts in the company, which might just be you, or it could be, you know, your partner, you can set that up, um, can look at it. And if you agree that this is good new knowledge, you click another button and it's now part of a knowledge database that the newbie who comes on and says, so um, what do we know about wood windows? Can search wood windows and find the five things that went well and the three things that didn't. And, you know, it's like, uh, it's another piece of that, uh, of that um, database that you want to be able to sell and, and work with your successors on. So three pieces, work plan, actions, knowledge. What is the name of your software, Brian? Uh, it's called uh, Quality Works with a hyphen between quality and works, qualityworks.net. And that's actually the name of the, web, the, the site where it lives and, um, you know, all that kind of good stuff. Great. And so when someone goes to that website, qualityworks.net, what are they going to see? They're going to see that I need to do some work on it, uh, but I'm going to be doing that really quickly um, uh, after this event. Um, they'll see some more information about, um, about what it does, and they'll have an opportunity to um, sign up for a, a free 60-day trial full site. In other words, if you give me your logo and you give me the name of your contact, I'll set up a complete site for you and you can play with it for 60 days. And if you like it, then we can move that into a, a subscription. It, it runs by a monthly subscription. Um, and, um, and that's basically, you know, the way that works. It's, it's built around that. Perfect. And it's and, cheap. And, and well, and what would the, the size, what size firm would benefit from using your software the most? Well, I was a I was a seven person firm when I developed it, two partners and five staff, um, uh, and it worked fine for us. And we used it for a lot of projects. Um, I've also used it on a on a project with eight hundred users and and contacts. So I would say any scale. But I guess the key thing is I've been thinking a lot about you know stuff like pricing. And I mean, if you come to me, I, I'm I'm currently. Uh, it's currently being used on a $2 billion um, airport expansion, for example, in Canada. Um, and I negotiated a fixed monthly fee for however many people are going to use this thing. Um, but if you come to me with a as a small firm, um, what I would say to you is um, the cost is either um, $1 per hour per project or $1 per hour or employee. Um, so, and you, you kind of get to choose. So if you're a two person firm doing, um, currently doing seven projects and you want to use quality works for all seven, the cost is two times $1, per, $1 per hour means $150 a month. So essentially it would be $300 a month for a two person firm to do unlimited work on it. Because uh, I figure if I can't deliver a dollar an hour of value to you, then we shouldn't be talking. And but I also know that architects are notoriously poor. So um, if I, you know, when I one of the reasons I developed it was that I discovered there was lots of quality management and project management solutions for a five thousand person firm or a five hundred person firm, and there weren't any for a five person firm. So that's what I sort of aimed at at the time. Yeah, very true. That's interesting. Well, I'm happy to report that the listeners of Business of Architecture are actually in the top 5% of architects, so they are flush with cash. Excellent. So you should see, you should see people flocking uh, to, to the software. So what do people get when they, when they get your software? What, what are they going to get, Brian? Um, well, the out of the box, so to speak, the, one of the things that happens with a lot of software is you get a platform and, and it's like a bare, empty platform bunch of functionality you have to spend forever populating it. So what I've done is I've, is I've created the typical um, design and construction process for architects and engineers. 
Uh, and, I've, and I've drawn it from a combination of my own experience, but more importantly, from uh, typical um, sources, AIA, um, the UK and the, and the Canadian equivalents. Um, you know, here's, here's how we do schematic design. Here's how we do design development, working drawings, uh, you know, and all the field stuff. Um, so what you get, if you, if you say, okay, um, I want to set up a project and I'm a Canadian architect, click the button. Here are the, uh, and, you know, and it's a two-story building um, and it's a school. So you'll get a, a, a fairly lengthy list of all the things you need to do from beginning to end right off the bat and right out of the box. And, but that's essentially a copy of a master list that I have. So if you look at it and you say, okay, good, good, good. Oh, we do that differently. Okay, you go into your master copy and you change that once. I don't see that, that's your, that you own that, not me. Um, and then every time thereafter, when you come to that piece, it's your piece. So over time you customize it, but you got a lot of meat to start with. Um, so you basically get a, a huge library. Uh, it's about 400 procedures um, and processes. There are um, about 100 various kinds of checklists. There are various forms, submittal, field review, you know, all the typical pieces. And all the forms, they're, the forms except for spreadsheets, uh, when I do costing, the, the application doesn't is not a spreadsheet. Um, so in those locations, I have created spreadsheets that work for me in terms of changes of the work and payments to our, uh, uh, payment certification. But most of the forms are what are called HTML forms. So they're native part of the, of the program, um, which means that if I email you a submittal and you open up the email, uh, wherever you open it, whether it's on your phone, your tablet, your laptop, uh, whatever, and whether or not you have quality works you will actually see the table with all the data and you can fill in the stuff you need to and send it back to me, as opposed to, um, you know, you know, here, here's the, see the attached submittal and then you open it up and you have to play with it in some other piece of software. So a lot of native stuff, um, basically all of the stuff that I've developed over the years um, and managed to steal from various people. <laughs> so, so this is meant to manage the flow of the project from construction document production, including quality assurance text uh, checks for the actual documents themselves, uh, all, yes. the, all the way and, and, through construction administ contract administration and managing the contract in terms of, you know, answering RFIs, tracking them, job site reports. Uh, do you also mention something about fee costing or something about project planning? Is there any kind of project management or fee tracking ability built into the software? Um, no, there isn't. But um, but what I've uh, I, I decided not to try and compete with financial software. Um, but what I have done successfully, so you create that work plan, um, and it's a it's actually a database. It looks like a spreadsheet, but it's a database. But you can select all, and I've done this, paste it into an Excel spreadsheet, and then all the steps, all the procedures are there. And then you can basically add two columns, hourly rate or three columns, hours, fee. Um, and I've done this where you can go down and you just, that's where your experience comes in. Okay, it's going to take 25 hours to do this. It's going to be done by Peter, his rate, so-and-so. Um, and literally, you work through and at the end, you have your fee. Uh, and the nice thing about that, of course, is is we're always taught and we want to not negotiate fees. We want to negotiate scope. You don't want me to do the full meal deal. Here's what I have to do by law. The rest of that stuff was kind of nice. And if you want to me not to do, if you, if you want me to, to reduce my fee by $10,000. Okay, let's talk about what scope pieces you don't want me to do. I'm not going to just take $10,000 off and do everything. So this gives you very quickly a very long list. Here's all the stuff. And when you sit down with a client with that, uh, it becomes much more difficult for them to, to, to remove stuff because, you know, it's, you know, I have to do this. And, okay, you don't want me to do a model, but you told me that your board of directors insists on a model. So who's going to do the model? Um, you know, this is just a whole, um, so that's the way I use it financially. And, 
for payment certification and changes, I have a simple spreadsheet that um, uh, that, it, that that is attached to the action around those things. Perfect. Well, Brian, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about in today's interview or mention to our audience? Um, well, to go back to the book, I'll just say that well, two things. Um, it's available as an ebook or as a paperback. Um, it's available um, through uh, Amazon, through Barnes and Noble, um, uh, Indigo in in Canada. Um, pretty broadly available. Um, uh, it's around eight fifty to ten dollars for the ebook, depending upon the day of the week and who you go to. the The retail price for the book is thirty five dollars. Um, uh, and that's basically um, uh, it's thirty five dollars if you if you buy it conventionally because so many people take a cut along the way. So I'll say to your viewers that if you send me a check for twenty dollars, I can get you a, a, a copy and I make the same royalty because that fifteen dollar difference, that's what all the other folks are are taking. So that's a special deal for business of architecture uh, uh, listeners. Excellent. So that book is An Architect's Guide to Construction Tales from the Trenches by Brian Palmquist. Brian, anything else about the book that you wanted to mention? Um, no, I, I, I think it's, it's, designed as, it's designed for uh, architects of all ages. Uh, I've had a number of, of older architects read it and they argue with me about various things, but then they say, yeah, that piece about submittals, that made a lot of sense. So there's a lot of, of, of stuff to mine there. The other thing I will mention is that um, uh, I'm, I'm planning book two, An Architect's Guide to Quality, um, and partly because of you know the hat I'm wearing now, but uh, I want to do this one differently. Rather than writing it all, I want to become editor. So I'm going to be announcing, I have a, a LinkedIn site called An Architect's Guide, which actually had half the people on it are not architects, which is cool. They're builders and, and engineers and other consultants, and we have good discussions there. But um, I, I'd like to basically solicit tales and lessons from others. Um, they will get, they'll have their chapter, their tale with their name. They'll get, um, if, <laughs> if we sell enough copies to make a profit, they'll get a a, a piece of that, but it's a way to kind of tell your story. I'm, I'm starting to get people saying, you know, I have a story about this. So I want to try and capture that because I'm just one guy mm. and I could probably write a book full of quality tales, but I'd much rather um, go to the broader audience and, you know, help more people talk to more people. So that's probably going to be kicking off uh, uh, September, October when, you know, the kids are back to school. Okay, so if you're listening to this and you have some tales from the trenches you want to share with Brian, you can reach out to him at quality-works.net. Any other way they should get a hold of you, Brian? Um, well, that, that, that's the, the best email is 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 uh, B Palmquist. So first initial, last name at qualityworks.net, um, and that will Great. get to me. I also I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, so those things have communication capabilities too. Um, so any of those things. And uh, yeah. Excellent. Well, just a final word, word here on the book. I hope all of our listeners definitely pick this up, whether you're starting out or whether you've been in the industry for a long time. It's always good to see the way someone else does something. And uh, it's just an excellent resource as we practice this profession of architecture. Uh, it does have, it's illustrated with over 200 diagrams and forms. So it's not just the stories, it's actual copies of the various checklists that Brian has developed you know, you'll see things in here like checklist, best practices, things about specifications and quality control, deficiency report. So go check it out. I'll put a I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Brian, it's been great having you on the business of architecture today. Thanks for coming on. Okay, and thank you for hosting it. It's a it's a great program. Appreciate it. Okay. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. 
Until next week, this has been the business of architecture. Views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.